We need to do it. Good morning. Um, thank you for joining us for Winship Grand Rounds this morning. Uh, if you are an Emory University or healthcare employee, I would like to receive a CME credit hour for attending today. Uh, the login information can be found in the chat feature right at the bottom of your screen. If you have any issues with this webinar or the CME login, uh, please send Kadia to Fofana an email or drop a note via the chat feature. Uh, this morning, we're really pleased and excited to welcome Dr. Andrew Cole. Uh, Dr. Cole completed his undergraduate studies at Brown University, graduating with honors in applied mathematics and biology. He then received his medical degree at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. He completed his residency training in internal medicine at the Beth Israel Hospital Harvard Medical School, followed by a fellowship in medical oncology at Stanford University Medical Center. He is currently a professor of medicine and the associate chief of the Division of Hematology Oncology at the University of California, San Francisco. His primary clinical and research interests focus on gastrointestinal cancers. Uh, particularly the development and evaluation of novel therapies for patients with pancreatic and upper GI malignancies. In addition to his role as the associate editor for the Journal of Clinical Oncology since 2016, he is currently the chair of the NCI's Pancreatic Cancer Task Force. He has served on the scientific program committee, the grant committee and special, specialty editorial board for ASCO. He plays an active leadership role in the Alliance for Clinical Trials in Oncology National Cooperative Group and sits on the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, NCCN Pancreatic Cancer Guidelines Committee. He also presently serves as the interim chief of the Division of Hematology Oncology at UCSF. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Cole. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate the uh, invitation uh, to speak this morning. I'm just sorry I couldn't come out to uh, Atlanta um, uh, to visit your uh, campus and your medical center. Hopefully I'll have, have the opportunity to do that at some point. So um, greetings from uh, San Francisco. Uh, where it's bright and early in the morning, and I have the privilege of being able to share with you uh, some of my thoughts and perspectives on um, pancreatic cancer, and, and particularly the uh, conception and, and design of clinical trials, which has been the primary focus of my uh, academic uh, career and uh, research focus. And, and I, I call this designing clinical trials in pancreas cancer challenges and innovations, because it really has been a very uh, challenging field uh, to work in, and certainly one that my mentors very early on were sort of uh, wondering why I wanted to uh, enter uh, a field like this. But I think now, you know, we have a really a critical mass of, um, of both scientists and uh, uh, clinical researchers who are uh, really dedicated to uh, studying in this disease and, and trying to uh, make large impacts for um, our patients, which I think many of you in this audience know is a, a really, really um, tough disease. These are just my uh, disclosures. Um, I uh, helped to lead and develop a number of uh, clinical trials. So this is clinical research support that's paid directly to my institution. And then I sit on a few uh, advisory boards and um, uh, independent uh, data monitoring boards as well. Just to give this group a, a lay of the land in terms of the scope of the problem. So uh, folks are probably aware that pancreas cancer relative to basically any other malignancy is associated with the, the poorest survival stage for stage. And, and uh, over time, we're seeing this uh, in terms of cancer-related mortality as uh, becoming really one of the leading causes of uh, cancer deaths in the United States. Um, Projections are within this decade, it's gonna to rise to the second leading um, cause of cancer mortality just after lung cancer uh, and surpassing uh, uh, colorectal and um, liver cancers. Now, 
One of the main issues is this is a disease that unfortunately is not caught early in the vast majority of patients. Um, 80 plus percent of folks uh, will have inoperable disease at the time they are diagnosed. So it will be either locally advanced or metastatic. There's certainly a lot of efforts in terms of trying to identify high risk populations uh, that might be um, uh, benefited by screening. But at present, there's not really a population wide screening tool uh, that can be used um, uh, to pick up this disease either early or in its precancerous stages. Right now, the mainstay of treatment for that majority of patients who are um, who have advanced disease is chemotherapy. And there are really two main options we think about um, for a treatment of this disease, um, and both are based on uh, prospective large phase three studies. Uh, one is a regimen called Fulfirinox, 5-FU, leucovorin, irinotecan, and oxaliplatin. Uh, the other one is gemcitabine and nabpaclitaxel. Uh, both of these in uh, phase three studies have shown superiority in terms of survival and other clinically meaningful endpoints, PFS response rate compared to gemcitabine monotherapy. And uh, hard to believe it's almost a, a decade since these uh, regimens have sort of come into our regular um, treatment paradigms uh, for advanced metastatic disease. But what I show here are some of the challenges in terms of pancreatic cancer treatment, and this kind of spills over as I talk about clinical trial design. Um, one is just a lack of predictive biomarkers. We talk a lot about precision oncology, and in pancreatic cancer, we're, I'll say we're getting there, but uh, are, I still have a long ways to go. Uh, you've probably seen in, in for lung cancer, sort of that pie with the different uh, subgroups of patients with lung cancer, uh, each with different actionable mutations and how that guides therapy. And we have a few of those uh, really small slices of the, of the pie, but they, they really represent only uh, oftentimes uh, one or 2% of our pancreatic cancer population in whom we have sort of uh, precise targeted therapies to apply to. Um, in addition, the, the ability actually even to get the tumor tissue itself has long been an issue. So if there's any gastroenterologists in this uh, audience uh, certainly getting uh, tumor tissue uh, core biopsies uh, by um, endoscopic ultrasound um, still poses a challenge at time. The tumor microenvironment, uh, which includes both the, the extracellular uh, components, the stroma, uh, as well as some of the cellular aspects, um, is really a, I'll call it a ripe target for um, targeting manipulation. Um, but it in and of itself may represent um, um, a barrier in terms of uh, both drug delivery and sort of the um, effector T cell um, component of, of our immune system, um, which is part of what makes these cancers quite um, immunologically cold. Um, if you look at that microenvironment, it really is the um, uh, sort of the uh, myelin-derived suppressor cells, the um, tumor-associated macrophages, so the Tregs, sort of all of those conspire to make a sort of more of an immunosuppressive uh, milieu, and, and uh, a number of scientists um, much more knowledgeable than I have um, uh, dedicated their careers to, to figuring out how to manipulate and, and overcome that. I talk about crosstalk and, and feedback loops, so it's, it's, it's a little bit like a whack-a-mole uh, if you will, it just trying to hamper or hinder one signaling pathway often will lead to upregulation of another. Uh, we and a number of other folks have uh, demonstrated uh, that principle. So just kind of hitting these, uh, this cancer with a, a single target agent is just not really a effective strategy. And then clinically, I'll say, and this applies to just our regular treatment of, of uh, patients who we see in clinic, but also getting them enrolled in clinical trials, is limited because um, pancreatic cancer, one of the hallmarks is really this uh, cachexia, this inanition um, that leads to just a, oftentimes a rapidly declining performance status for our patients. As it stands, um, data from a few years ago show that fewer than 5% of patients with pancreas cancer enroll on clinical trials. Um, survey data from PanCan, now this is a few years old, but um, I think the results have not gotten a, a whole lot better. 
uh, show that almost uh, half of uh, patients report never discussing clinical trials with their physician. And particularly after they progress on frontline chemotherapy, um, it's just a small percentage who um, are offered or, or think about uh, clinical trials um, uh, once they get beyond the first line setting. I think some of the barriers to that uh, include just availability and accessibility, not just patients who may live very far away, but just availability of trials. I'll, I'll say that even though I'm responsible for helping to oversee our trial portfolio at UCSF, oftentimes I don't have good studies to offer patients, particularly in the later line settings. Uh, I mentioned uh, poor performance status, and, and some studies, frankly, have overly stringent or prohibitive eligibility criteria that don't allow them to participate. And then, uh, frankly, on the part I, of uh, us, providers, um, I, I think uh, sometimes a nihilistic attitude can um, prevail, and that certainly represents a, a challenge. And then I'll also note, we've had a poor clinical trial track record to date. And I might even argue that a number of the trials that we have uh, developed and run are frankly uninspiring. And the question is, how can we do better? Preparing for this talk allowed me to look back um, now, gosh, it was 20 years ago um, that I, I came out of fellowship uh, and started a, a junior faculty position at UCSF. And I just wanted to share with this group my first investigator-initiated pancreatic cancer trial, which was really very straightforward. It was a single-arm, non-randomized phase two study, just looking at, at the time, what was a, a novel chemotherapy combination of gemcitabine given in this sort of uh, prolonged infusion called fixed dose rate plus low-dose uh, low cisplatin. And you can see here the Kaplan-Meier survival curve median overall survival of seven months in a cohort of uh, 51 patients, response rate of 19%. And you can see in, in 2006, we actually published this in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, which kind of boggles my mind now because the, I wanna just share my last bullet point in, in this slide that the likelihood of publishing a study like this in the JCO in 2023 would be 0%. Uh, so I have the privilege of serving as an associate editor on the Journal of Clinical Oncology, so I have actually have to handle many uh, submissions for this journal, and, and we've gone way past that type of a study now, uh, 15, 20 years later. And, and the reasons for that are, I, I list here, and, and this isn't to be overly self-critical, but it's just saying that um, this was a, the trial design itself, single arm, single institution experience. I think we all recognize the inherent selection biases when we do studies just at academic centers with um, specialized expertise, uh, like uh, you know, like Emory or um, or any place where they have just where you have all of the uh, resources and specialty care and supportive care needed um, to to really improve patients' uh, outcomes. Comparing to historic controls uh, for these types of studies is just fraught with potential risk. Um, even today, using historic control data for fulfirinox and gemnap paclitaxel can be um, uh, misleading uh, because this is a really moving target. Referral patterns, stage migration. And, and what this leads to is a high likelihood of what statisticians call a type 1 error. So a false positive signal um, from your trial may make the results seem more promising than they really are. Um, that study I showed you um, had no built-in early look for futility. And importantly, and I'll get to this, really had very little in terms of biomarker selection <clears throat> or any embedded correlative science, which now really is a must in uh, when we think about and, and develop clinical trials uh, in this uh, current day and age. So the question I, I wanna pose is how do we do better in developing clinical trials in pancreatic cancer? And I'll say in pancreatic cancer, but for uh, any of you who are uh, more broader in your interests or, or in, in another field. I, I think this can apply to um, uh, really many cancers, but I want to talk specifically about in, in pancreatic cancer. And so these are a few of the questions that I uh, want to pose. Uh, first of all, what defines a clinically meaningful outcome or improvement in this disease? Incorporating integral biomarkers uh, within clinical trials, is that is that a realistic uh, goal or is it just more aspirational? 
what disease settings should we focus on our attention on in pancreatic uh, cancer treatment for novel drug development? And then I'll briefly touch at the end about some novel trial designs that we can use to, to both minimize that type one error I talked about, and importantly, to accelerate the process of drug development and approval. Uh, the last couple of bullet points I, I probably won't get to talk about uh, very much in the interest of time, but why, why don't I start by our thinking together about what defines a clinically meaningful outcome um, in this disease. And I just show here again for way of historical perspective, one of the um, uh, early and very important trials in the annals of pancreatic cancer uh, uh, treatment and, and trials. And this was a NCI Canada study called the PA3 trial of gemcitabine plus erlotinib. And the survival curves uh, shown here almost speak for themselves, right? This was um, a large randomized trial of gemcitabine with or without the, the oral TKI or lotinib. And you can see this technically was a significant result. But I think anyone can look at these um, uh, survival curves, which are pretty close to overlapping. And you can see that a uh, hazard ratio of 0.82 for survival an improvement in median survival by 0.33 months. Um, this is held up as a trial which, while statistically significant, may not necessarily be that clinically meaningful. And so for uh, if there are any trainees on this um, uh, call, uh, you probably never even think of erlotinib uh, much, even though technically it's still on companion guidelines and um, technically remains an, an option. We really have moved past that in terms of in terms of this being part of our regular uh, treatment paradigms for uh, pancreatic cancer. And I think the, the, the study data almost speak themselves. ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, actually uh, had a uh, sort of a uh, expert group convened to uh, provide recommended targets for meaningful clinical trial goals um, for pancreatic cancer. And you can see if, if sort of the benchmarks for fulfurinax eligible or gemcitabine and paclitaxel eligible patients ranges from eight to 11 months, then um, this group sort of decided that the improvement over current median overall survival that would be clinically meaningful is in the range of three to four months for gemnat paclitaxel or four to five months for fulfurinax eligible patients. And you can see the corresponding improvements in one-year survival uh, rates um, that, again, should be we should be aspiring to, uh, as well as the target hazard ratios for, uh, for survival. And so these are pretty high bars, and one that, uh, if you look at basically the trials that have been run, even those that are positive, have really struggled to, to meet those types of uh, benchmarks. To provide a more recent uh, example, um, uh, at our ASCO GI meeting that was held in San Francisco just a, a couple of weeks ago, um, this was sort of the uh, one of the most highly eagerly anticipated uh, uh, trials to uh, uh, to be presented. And this was a random an international randomized phase three study of gemcitabine nab paclitaxel versus what I'll call a sort of a, a, a altered fulfurinox regimen called Nalirifox. So that's using the nanoliposomal form of ivernitecan called Naliri. Uh, that's a drug that we actually helped uh, in clinical development at UCSF uh, many years ago. And basically saying, well, if we substitute nanoliposomal ivernitecan in for free ivernitecan in the fulfurinox regimen, will that be superior to gemnab paclitaxel? You'll see fairly strategically that the decision was made um, not to compare Naleri Fox to sort of the standard Fulfurinox uh, regimen. Um, but this trial for the frontline treatment of metastatic pancreatic cancer was presented by Zev Weinberg uh, a couple of weeks ago. And again, when you look at the survival outcomes, this was a positive study. Again, I highlight in the yellow box, this is my highlighting, um, not Dr. Weinberg's, but uh, a hazard ratio of 0 0.83 in favor of Naleri Fox with a median survival difference of 11.1 .1 versus 9.2 months. So again, a significant result, but if you think back on the, the table I showed you in terms of what we we're aspiring to in clinical trials in pancreas cancer, uh, 
not one that not one that necessarily meets those thresholds in terms of um, a huge benefit, um, either in terms of median OS or that that hazard ratio for survival. This was a JAMA oncology paper from a few years ago, and I think this was very insightful too, because uh, for those of you who might be uh, uh, developing, writing, leading uh, sort of early phase trials or, or phase two studies, I, I think that a big question in those studies is the go, no-go decision um, in terms of what kind of result in your smaller phase two study should trigger the investment and commitment to a large phase three study. And you can see here that um, if you kind of dive deeper and look at the phase two, uh, look at phase two study results and see whether they really met their primary endpoint, it's, it has a reasonable predictive value in terms of whether the phase three result is going to be positive or negative. And, and the point is that in the majority of these phase two studies, they actually did not meet their primary endpoint, essentially the statistical uh, uh, assumptions that were made in terms of, of what would be a, a positive readout in survival or response rate or whatever the primary endpoint uh, was. But many of those studies ended up going on to phase three trial development. And the greatest ability to predict some a phase three result that would be clinically meaningful, um, this analysis basically showed that that decision about it at the phase two level is that there should be a 50% improvement in median uh, overall survival with a 90% increase in one year survival rate. So again, a very high bar, but uh, as we think moving forward in terms of our trials or the readouts we're getting from uh, our smaller studies, uh, keep that in mind. Um, uh, I certainly do in, in terms of thinking about powering uh, a particular study or what kind of readout I'm looking for. Uh, in terms of is this something really that's going to move the field forward. In terms of in, uh, incorporating integral biomarkers um, and whether that's realistic or not in pancreatic cancer. It, first, by way of definitions, when I talk about an integral biomarker, that's a uh, marker that we use that is essential for study conduct. In other words, patients cannot enroll on the study unless they their tumor expresses this particular uh, marker or gene signature, um, or it's used for stratification, or it's actually one of the study endpoints. So that's very different from an integrated biomarker where uh, you might be collecting tissue or blood samples, um, but the, the actual uh, enrollment or aspect study aren't predicated on, on that particular biomarker. And so that, that sort of ties into the sort of exploratory endpoints of a, of a given trial um, where you're uh, maybe just trying to generate a hypothesis or, or test hypothesis, but it's not, um, right, it's, it's not integral in terms of the study can technically be conducted with, and you'll look at your clinical endpoints sort of irrespective of that. And it's the integral biomarkers that in, in pancreatic cancer trials that have been a, a real challenge, although we are seeing more studies in this realm um, at the present time. This aggregated data shows the uh, trends in use of biomarkers in oncology clinical trials in general uh, throughout the 2010s. Um, and, and you can see that the proportion of studies where there uh, is a, a biomarker, now again, the flaw in these data are it doesn't specify necessarily an integral biomarker, uh, as I was speaking about on the last slide. But you see that uh, maybe approximately uh, a third or more of studies um, have have this uh, biomarker analysis embedded within it. And if you look specifically at uh, pancreatic cancer trials, you'll see that um, at least up through 2018, uh, only a quarter of uh, pancreatic cancer studies had such um, um, uh, biomarker analyses uh, integrated uh, into them. Again, reflecting some of the challenges that I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> One of the issues, and this is especially relevant in pancreatic cancer, but in, in some other diseases as well, um, is that when you have a, a biomarker as part of study eligibility, whether that means acquiring fresh tissue which is, is the case in certain of uh, the studies we have ongoing now, um, 
uh, or even just being able to get tumor tissue, uh, get archived tumor tissue um, and send it to say a study sponsor for an in-house um, uh, biomarker assessment, that takes time. So the, the need for that is going to necessarily delay uh, a patient being able to start on um, your experimental therapy. And so there's the potential for screen failure when you already have a, a rather ill patient population. And conversely, when you think about uh, trials that have these integral biomarkers, what, what you're doing is really selecting for patients who are fit enough to have that time to wait to, to determine whether they're eligible. And so there's already an inherent selection bias um, because they're positively selecting for the fitter patients who may have slightly less aggressive disease biology. So th this is sort of an, the ASCO's statement for the ethical framework for research biopsies. And in terms of both maximizing scientific utility while at the same time minimizing participant risk. And in terms of promoting best practices in the conduct of research biopsies, what is glaringly missing from um, this is language regarding the time it takes to schedule biopsies, access uh, archive material, and the turnaround time for any assay results. And that's, um, that's a challenge at our institution. I don't know how it is at Emory, but um, we really struggle uh, in terms of uh, being able to uh, get necessary uh, biopsies for our patients for research purposes, or because we're a tertiary referral center and patients often will come with um, biopsies performed elsewhere, to be able to track down that material, get it sent to UCSF, which we then subsequently have to send out to a sponsor we're working with um, for um, uh, assay, that takes time. Uh, and that's often time that our patients don't have. More broadly speaking, when it comes to uh, pancreatic cancer, uh, we, there's now a, a broader recommendation that number one, uh, we do germline testing. So look for inherited um, susceptibility uh, genes in all patients now, irrespective of their family history. And to do somatic or tumor tissue testing um, to look for actionable mutations. And that we should be considering that in all of our patients with uh, advanced pancreas cancer who are candidates for therapy. But the question, um, and what I posed early on was, uh, when it comes to these, uh, this sort of precision oncology approach is wh what, what useful information can we really get from that in our pancreatic cancer population? Uh, this is a really nice national initiative called Know Your Tumor, uh, supported by the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network, uh, which uh, offered comprehensive genomic, proteomic, and, and actually even phosphoprotein-based molecular profiling of patients with pancreatic cancer to our uh, um, uh, patients. So this was a resource that was offered to try to streamline this. And, and where I think the data are kind of uh, perhaps open to interpretation is what they call actionable genomic alterations. And uh, this report suggested that up to 50% uh, of patients had, quote, actionable genomic alterations. But the reason I, I sort of might question these data is because what they define as actionable uh, include things like just... Um, you know, if they had a alteration in the mTOR pathway or in um, uh, cell cycling genes, because, because those perhaps conceptually might suggest certain targeted therapies, but in, in reality, those, uh, those sort of targeted therapies we have to date have not shown a track record in the clinical setting for pancreatic cancer. And so my point is the therapeutic actionability of many of these putative predictive biomarkers really is, is questionable. And for pancreatic cancer, the, the presence of biomarkers with true clinical actionability are uncommon or even exceedingly rare. And so when we think about clinical trials in this disease, um, it presents the usual, well, you got to screen 20 or 50 or 100 patients to identify even one eligible patient. Um, and, and that's something we certainly struggle with in terms of how many of those studies can we afford to open uh, at our institution, even, even though sometimes they may benefit patients who happen to have that mutation 
uh, greatly. And I already pointed out that our, our patients just oftentimes can't afford to wait very long for readouts. But the point here being that matched therapy can improve survival. And so again, a, a subsequent analysis uh, from this data set, uh, Know Your Tumor, showed that for patients who had an actionable finding, and admittedly only a small proportion of those went on to receive a molecularly matched therapy, the benefits for, that, for those patients who had those uh, findings, who got matched therapy, was significantly better than those who uh, either were unmatched or had no actionable uh, marker. So identifying these patients, being able to offer them something um, in the targeted realm, if they have one of these mutations, can be very impactful. But I'm just gonna show a few examples of, of both trials and particular drugs that are either available or in development that um, we know can be uh, impactful, even if they only impact a very small proportion of our pancreatic cancer population. So KRAS, we know that that's a, a gene that's almost a ubiquitous uh, a mutation that is very, very commonly seen. I should say in 90 plus percent of uh, patients, according to some courts, have a KRAS a mutation. But we know that not all KRAS mutations are created uh, equally. Um, the vast majority in pancreatic cancer are this so-called G12D mutation. Second most common is G12V. And the G12C mutations uh, comprise only 1% to 2% of uh, pancreatic cancers. Why is, that, uh, why is that impactful? Well, um, the now because we have these G12C inhibitors, and I apologize, this, uh, this uh, footer is wrong um, here. This was uh, data actually that uh, was uh, published in the New England Journal um, uh, that showed that the uh, direct G12C inhibitor, cetericib, um, for patients, that small uh, slice of um, uh, patients who have a G12C KRAS mutation for pancreatic cancer, you see this waterfall plot with a very striking response rate. Um, technically, it's only 21%, and this is a chemo uh, refractory patient population, but the disease control rate and the minor responses encompass greater than 80% of patients. Uh, so this is a really important proof of principle in terms of the use of a targeted therapy. And for the longest time, these, G, these uh, KRAS inhibitors have long been the holy grail in terms of how can how could we target what was previously felt to be an undruggable um, uh, mutant protein? Um, and uh, folks much smarter than myself have, have sort of dedicated their careers to this. And, um, and now we have uh, sort of a proof of principle in terms of the ability to do that, at least for the, um, the G12C genotype. And again, um, a, a smaller cohort, but uh, another G12C inhibitor, uh, Adagrasib, um, Tony Bekai Saab has uh, shared this uh, uh, data um, a couple of years ago, uh, showing again quite striking response rates for a pretreated patient population. Second example uh, I'll give is uh, one that Dr. Schramm from Memorial Sloan Kettering um, uh, presented um, more than a year ago, but again, showing that in the again, admittedly small uh, proportion of patients with um, pancreatic uh, cancer that have this energy one fusion. And this is basically um, seen mostly, but not exclusively in KRAS wild type patients that a bispecific HER2, HER3 antibody called uh, a xenocutuzumab, um, which basically blocks the interaction between the energy ligands with uh, HER3, which um, is, basically dimerizes with uh, HER2, that in, uh, now this was true across solid tumors, but I'm just showing you the waterfall plot specifically for pancreatic cancer. You see uh, more than 40% of patients had a confirmed partial response and a majority actually had stable disease or a minor response. So again, proof principle in terms of just a drug and a, a trial. Now, granted, these are uh, 
uh, sort of bucket trials. They work for all solid tumors. And as we're seeing an increasing number of uh, uh, drugs approved sort of on a disease agnostic basis, uh, it'll be hard for these very uh, small um, groups of patients to have, say, a pancreas specific trial. But I think it's just important for us to recognize how we now have these targetable, uh, actionable uh, mutations or genetic alterations um, in our pancreatic cancer population. And the third example I'll give is one that uh, this audience may be more uh, uh, aware of, and that's the broad indication for um, uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors for microsatellite unstable MSI high solid tumors. And that's true in pancreatic cancer as well, again, although again, the incidence of MSI high is only in the range of 1% or so. But I show here the Keynote 158 uh, data uh, for pembrolizumab. Um, and you can see for pancreatic cancer, um, the, the response rate for immune checkpoint inhibition was only 18%. So even, uh, so even compared to other solid tumors um, that are MSA high, pancreatic cancer is really difficult um, uh, uh, to treat, even when, even when technically uh, immunotherapy should be beneficial on the basis of their, of their uh, sort of high MSI status. Uh, and I'll, I'll say parenthetically, this is the reason why even for our Lynch-related or MSI high pancreatic cancer patients, I don't use immune checkpoint inhibition as the front line of therapy because we can do better with, with chemotherapy um, before turning to uh, IO therapy. What I'll say is uh, these examples I gave sort of were the, the half percent or one or two percent. Um, probably the most actionable finding for pancreatic cancer is HRD or homologous recombination deficient associated um, uh, disease. Because depending on your patient population, that might be anywhere from five to 15% of um, patients. Now for this, I'm talking about both core HRD genes, so BRCA1, BRCA2, PALB2, and then the others that we sometimes see. So ATM, you'll often see in your gene panels, eight, uh, uh, patients with pancreas cancer of ATM mutations. Um, this has therapeutic relevance, both in terms of sensitivity to platinum analogs and the application of PARP inhibitors in the maintenance settings. And I will say there's intense interest in developing clinical trials specifically for this subgroup of patients. This is just one of multiple lines of evidence that shows that uh, HRD associated here, we, it's referred to as DDR or DNA um, uh, deficient repair on um, pancreatic cancer patients um, clearly benefit when they receive platinum-based therapy. And that's true in the frontline and the second line setting, but um, patients with HRD mutations have better overall survival when they're treated with platinum agents, better PFS, and what I want to show here is some uh, uh, data from uh, one of my collaborators, uh, Ken Olive, a, a very uh, talented physici physician scientist at, um, uh, at Columbia University. And, and this brings up the question of whether all platinum analogs are created equally. So we know uh, uh, fulfurinox, oxaliplatin, we use that in pancreatic cancer. But it turns out that in uh, a BRCA null mouse model of, of, of pancreatic cancer, uh, these mice actually respond much better to cisplatin monotherapy as compared to oxaliplatin. And this may be based on some differences in uh, mechanism of action, uh, but you can see here, and this is in mouse studies, that, that uh, uh, mice treated with cisplatin do much better um, compared to oxaliplatin. And in fact, we have uh, this clinical observation from a study that used gemcitabine and cisplatin as the chemotherapy backbone for pancreatic cancers with um, germline BRCA or PALB2 mutations. And you can see in this waterfall plot a, a really robust response rate of uh, 65, 70 plus percent um, with or without a PARP inhibitor. So this was technically a negative study, but I just want you to focus on the uh, fact that these patients just receiving gemcitabine and cisplatin, all with a BRCA or PALB2 mutation. Uh, had a very high likelihood of response beyond what we typically see um, uh, with chemotherapy. Uh, right now, myself and uh, a very talented, um, at the time, research fellow, now a junior faculty member, Erica Sang, um, have uh, proposed through our alliance uh, uh, cooperative group, and this is still under review at the NCI, um, a trial that's specifically 
trying to leverage this observation in BRCA mutated um, pancreatic cancer patients after fulfurinox, seeing if continuing them on a platinum agent with specifically cisplatin in the second line setting um, may be beneficial. So the trial randomizes patients in the second line setting to get either gemnap paclitaxel or gemnap paclitaxel with cisplatin. And again, this is specifically for um, uh, HRD deficient, specifically BRCA and PALB2 mutated patients. Again, as I talk about uh, integral uh, biomarkers in, in trial design, this was actually a very important one, the uh, POLO trial, which um, uh, basically looked at a PARP inhibitor, Olaparib, as maintenance therapy um, uh, for patients with germline BRCA mutated metastatic pancreatic cancer. Um, talk about screening a large number of patients. This was more than 3,000 patients screened to identify just 150 eligible patients. So really a Herculean effort. Uh, and you can see that um, the published results originally in the New England Journal of Medicine showed that in showed a doubling of median PFS, hazard ratio quite impressive of 0.53, uh, when Olaparib was used compared to placebo in patients with germline BRCA-associated metastatic pancreas cancer after they had responded to a platinum-based chemotherapy regimen. So again, that principle of platinum sensitivity. So this isn't patients who had progressed. They were, um, uh, they had shown stable or responding disease that um, continuing them on treatment with a PARP inhibitor um, was beneficial. And this, I didn't wanna to get too much in the mechanism, uh, but this really uh, takes advantage of this principle of synthetic lethality uh, in terms of the the inherent um, uh, inability to, re, uh, to repair a DNA damage. Now, on the other hand, overall survival was not um, uh, improved with this strategy, which does represent a, a limitation, although you do see um, clearly a greater percentage of patients living two years or greater. And again, that two-year survival rate of 37% is, is pretty striking um, for this um, uh, patient population. I'll note, uh, just based on uh, one of my other hats as, as chairing our um, uh, NCI's pancreatic, pancreatic Cancer um, uh, Task Force, is a number of the cooperative group trials we're doing in the national setting are looking specifically at this HRD subgroup. So I just want to highlight a couple for the uh, groups, um, uh, to, for the group to be aware of. Uh, and this is an, uh, uh, an ECOG study, Apollo, which is basically looking at this same strategy in resected patients, um, pancreatic cancer patients, in which uh, after they get their surgery and their adjuvant chemotherapy um, are randomized to either a laparib or placebo for one year. And then trying to take advantage of some observations in terms of possible synergism between PARP inhibitors and uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, uh, this is a SWOG, an ongoing SWOG trial in which uh, patients, again, in the maintenance setting are randomized to Olaparib or Olaparib plus pembrolizumab. I wanna to touch uh, perhaps just briefly on which disease settings we should be focusing our attention on in novel drug development. And I show here what I think about trial development and um, sort of where there are gaps in our knowledge base and, and, and just where the needs are for our patients. Um, I show obviously metastatic, locally advanced, resectable disease. Um, but in, in each of these settings, and I've, I mentioned this briefly before with the POLO trial, there's a opportunity in the maintenance uh, context to be studying some of these drugs. So oftentimes, you know, we'll think of, oh, a, 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 what do we offer patients after they've progressed on first line or second line therapy? But I think we have a real opportunity in the maintenance context uh, uh, context to, to study drugs, um, uh, especially uh, ones that we might not necessarily expect massive cytal reduction, right? But we, we, we think that there's evidence that it may be able to hold a uh, cancer in check. And I think that's a really valuable opportunity um, because I think we are changing the natural history of this disease at least somewhat. And, and we have more patients who have done well on their chemotherapy, on their fulfurinox or um, and but they want to know what comes next because they obviously can't stay on chemotherapy forever. The key considerations for maintenance therapy, and I, I show on this schema in a, in a trial that um, uh, I've 
co-authored with one of our junior faculty at, at our institution is, is sort of this idea of um, what defines effective or even ideal maintenance therapy. So it basically is to something that is convenient for patients that uh, minimizes the, the exposure to overly toxic um, uh, treatment. And uh, ideally, this is something that allows them to have a prolonged freedom from very set, uh, aggressive cytotoxic therapy um, with a low degree of um, cumulative toxicity. And so I mentioned PARP inhibitors, but that's just for the subgroup of patients with uh, BRCA or PALB2 mutations. But otherwise, what we typically do is de-escalate um, uh, our chemotherapy. Um, and I just show here, you know, there have been a few forays into looking at non-chemotherapy regimens, targeted therapies or, or immunotherapies. And um, we haven't gotten very far um, using the strategy to date, I'll admit. I, I want to show one example from uh, uh, Kim Rice Binder uh, from Penn uh, published last year, because I think this was very striking because uh, she used a, a strategy of niraparib, uh, a PARP inhibitor, together with an immunotherapy agent. And I mentioned before uh, the, 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 the possible synergism between the two, but really found that using niraparib with the ctla 4 inhibitor, ipilimumab, um, the results were surprisingly good. And that included patients who didn't have any BRCA or known HRD mutation. Uh, so what you see in the, I showed just this waterfall plot on the right-hand side of, the, of her uh, data, uh, where you see actually some striking uh, responses. And again, this was in a majority of patients who had no HRD type of mutations at all. And so I think a further dive in, in terms of why that is, whether C why anti-CTLA-4 might be uh, better in terms of partnering with um, a PARP inhibitor compared to um, uh, a PD-1 inhibitor um, still remains to be defined. But I just think this was very, very intriguing work. And then I'll just give a shout out to a study that uh, I'm uh, currently leading um, that is ongoing, and that's using a little bit of a different strategy, and again, in the maintenance setting. And it's a trial of capecitabine um, uh, with or without ivaltinostat, which is a pan-HDAC inhibitor. Um, in which we've seen some anti-tumor activity um, using uh, this uh, uh, combination in syngenetic uh, pancreatic mouse models. So this is currently a national study. It's in its uh, um, dose finding phase right now, but once we uh, define a, a safe dose for the combination, uh, we'll be uh, looking at this specifically um, as a maintenance setting post fulfirinox I just want to briefly touch upon um, oligometastatic disease because I think this is a really cool opportunity for a uh, trial development. Um, I will say this is a tremendous interest again at the cooperative group level um, because I'm guessing uh, uh, some or many of you have patients who have done well with chemotherapy are left with very limited metastatic disease. And the question comes up, well, can is there any uh, any strategy for local regional treatment of this disease, surgery, ablation, embolization, uh, any of these. And of course, what we need to define in this setting and what we're discussing at a national level as well, what, how should we select patients? How do we even define oligometastatic disease, right? Is it three or fewer liver lesions? Can it involve multi-organs? And when should local regional treatment be applied in these patients? Should it come after at least six months of systemic therapy where they show good disease control. Um, and then again, in the biomarker category, are there any molecular features that might predict the benefit from that kind of intervention for um, oligometastatic disease? Uh, I'm gonna buzz through these data very quickly in the interest of time, because I know I only have a few minutes left, but um, there are some data in terms of looking at metastasectomy um, for these uh, uh, patients and granted, because it's primarily retrospective data, we're already positively selecting for patients. So it's a little hard to, to, to interpret these data, but at least the largest cohort um, out of Germany suggested that resection of oligometastatic disease um, uh, in this cohort 
uh, was associated with the median overall survival of more than 12 months. And this was in an era prior to the contemporary chemotherapies we have. I think more realistic is, is, is thinking about SBRT for oligometastatic disease. Again, this is being proposed um, at a national level. And I'm just showing a few um, both multi-center and uh, institutional experiences uh, using this uh, approach of SBRT for patients with limited pancreas cancer. Um, and while it's maybe a little difficult to um, talk about the survival results, uh, what is clear is that um, this strategy can benefit by patients, benefit patients by giving them a prolonged period free from systemic therapy. And that in and of itself may be a meaningful endpoint to look at in trials in terms of how long can you spare patients the need to be on chemotherapy with some of these approaches. Okay, um, I'm, I'm going to uh, finish uh, in my last uh, one or two minutes by just mentioning some, a couple of novel trial designs um, that we now um, uh, can employ. And this gets to the concept of master protocols. And, and at UCSF, we've been fortunate to be able to be part of uh, several nationwide um, uh, initiatives using what I'll call platform trial design. And a platform trial design is one in which you're able to test multiple novel therapies, not even necessarily concurrently, but in sort of a perpetual fashion where um, you have one arm open, maybe it looks good. If it doesn't, you sort of discard that one and then another arm enters. And so you've got a master protocol where you're able to sequentially test different regimens. It's sort of a hassle for your IRB because you have to constantly be approving uh, amendments. But this is a way in which you can um, uh, get more information more quickly than sort of your standardized randomized phase three study. And what you can do as part of this is what we call adaptive randomization in which um, you might be able to steer more patients towards one particular arm or another, or constantly change your ratios in terms of uh, uh, enrollment uh, based on real-time uh, analysis of the data. I actually think maybe in this forum, you've heard um, uh, from one of the leaders of our PANCAN uh, um, Precision Promise Consortium, uh, this national effort to, um, to sort of uh, work with the FDA to accelerate uh, drug development and, and testing um, in our pancreatic cancer uh, patients. So this is um, uh, called Precision Promise. Uh, UCSF, we were one of the, we were fortunate to be one of the inaugural sites uh, for this. But the idea here, as I said, is a platform trial design where we are iteratively and sequentially testing many different um, therapies. And I don't want to go into these in any detail, but really the idea is to constantly be testing drugs. And rather than needing to commit five or 600 patients in a randomized study design, um, we're able to do it with a much smaller number of patients and in agreement with the FDA if the signal looks strong enough, actually accelerate their um, uh, uh, approval. As its name implies, precision promise and getting back to the whole biomarker aspect, uh, there are mandatory pre and on treatment biopsies um, for really in-depth um, uh, next generation sequencing and molecular interrogation. Although these are not technically integral biomarkers. Uh, again, patients are able to go on as long as they're able to give tissue, but we don't wait for those results before they're randomized to one of the treatment arms. And then the last example I'll give is um, uh, uh, through the Parker Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy, or PICE. So uh, one of the other studies we've been involved in at a national level is, uh, again, a what is now a platform trial designed to evaluate multiple novel chemotherapy plus immunotherapy regimens. Um, and right now we have this so-called platform trial called Revolution, uh, in which we're looking at gemcitabine, nap, paclitaxel with a variety of novel immunotherapy uh, combinations. Um, some of them focused on CD40 agonists in combination with, um, uh, uh, or immunotherapy in combination with uh, anti-autophagy agents. So this is my last slide. I, I just wanna conclude by saying that sort of the old model for conducting clinical trials in pancreas cancer were, were sort of these small non-randomized studies. Maybe they'd have biomarkers, maybe they wouldn't. It was a very fixed approach to, to study design. Um, but now, and, and I'm seeing this even in my own uh, 
career and how we're thinking about clinical trials is, is these are much more cooperative efforts um, where there's real-time data sharing, where there's uh, fluidity in terms of um, uh, treatment arms and where there's absolutely mandatory um, biomarkers where we're trying to learn everything we can about uh, uh, every patient uh, with mandatory biopsies uh, uh, built in. And I'll, I'll say that we're even starting to explore some more chemotherapy-free approaches. And um, uh, rather than just needing to partner everything with chemotherapy, we're, we're certainly very interested right now in, 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 in other forms of, of treatment, whether it be um, cellular therapies or otherwise that, um, that we might be able to offer our patients. So I'm sorry, I know that was a little bit of a whirlwind, but I, what I hope I, I was able to share with you is, is not just a historical perspective, but a little bit about where we're going forward. And for those of you who are interested in clinical trials, um, in, in that being a major part of your career, or maybe it already is, sort of uh, thinking creatively about uh, how we can sort of, um, uh, how we can be more creative and novel in, in terms of our our trial design. So with that, I'll thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any uh, questions or, or comments or just thoughts from, from the audience's perspective. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ko, for that excellent presentation. Uh, to the audience, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature uh, that is located at the bottom of your screen. And while we wait on questions, uh, just to remind uh, everybody on the call that there will not be any grand rounds uh, for next week, but we have a very interesting one coming up in two weeks. And to view all the upcoming Winship Grand Round lectures, uh, please visit the Grand Rounds page on the Winship Cancer Center website or the Winship uh, calendar. Uh, so we have a couple of questions already for Dr. Cole. Let me start uh, with the one from Dr. Suresh Ramalingam, who is the Cancer Center Director. So uh, thanks for the great talk. I'm referring to your point about the mandatory biopsy in clinical trials. Uh, our experience has been that it discourages patient participation in trials. Also, the data on the utility of these mandatory biopsies remains somewhat questionable in my view. Uh, I don't know, Andrew, if you have any thoughts about this. Yeah, no, I thank you for your comments and and uh, I think observation from your uh, experience, Suresh. And, and I would say that um, our experience is, is somewhat similar, uh, although I'll sell it, it, it may depend a little bit on the, both the patient population and the, um, uh, and the disease setting. And specifically, I guess, because I do uh, focus a lot on pancreas cancer, I, I do think this is a challenge in, in pancreatic cancer. It does depend a little bit on sort of how validated the biomarker um, is in terms of its predictive utility. Um, it also just depends on uh, things like the infrastructure you have at your institution and how uh, rapidly you're able to uh, get these done and the turnaround time for uh, a readout. I have some savvy patients who sort of recognize and want sort of this sort of precision medicine approach. And, and if, if you're able to explain it to them sort of why uh, sort of looking for targets makes uh, a lot of sense. Um, and I think that's sort of aspirational that, oh, if we talk with our patients about this, clearly they'll understand and we'll be able to uh, be willing to comply to that. But I completely agree with you that it really is, um, that it really is a challenge in terms of our uh, enrollment for some studies. I think it's so critically important on the one hand, but on the other hand, as you point out, it, it can be a, uh, a major detractor. And as I said, kind of bias our studies um, uh, in, in terms of uh, who we end up enrolling on, uh, on these patients. Um, and uh, so I, I think it's a point well taken. Uh, and one, I, you know, I bring up some of these issues, although I don't necessarily know how to uh, rectify or solve them uh, so much. It's just, I think, good for us to be aware of as we both think about studies and, um, uh, and interpreting the data. So another question, uh, this one from Dr. Ned Waller. Great talk. Uh, while response rates and the median overall survivor are disappointing in 
uh, pancreatic doctor adenocarcinoma. Uh, results from some of the randomized studies that you presented actually showed a 20% overall survival tail. Uh, is there any suggestion that a fraction of patients with metastatic disease remain progression-free? And are there any insights into what distinguish these exceptional responders from the majority of patients? Yeah, great question. And it's a very nice uh, observation uh, you're making. And for example, in the POLO data I showed, um, there was uh, anywhere from a 20 to 30 upwards of 30% even in a laparib treated patients. So again, I think your HRD subgroup of patients may be one where there is a, a prolonged survival. Um, I think your point in terms of what other molecular features might predict for that is ripe for investigation. I will say one area which I didn't even touch on all, which may be relevant is having to do with the uh, tumor microbiome. Um, and that's been looked at more in, and this is from some data out of Memorial Sloan Kettering and more in resected patients, but sort of the, the equivalent, the very long-term survivors, the sort of the equivalent of the exceptional responders may have a, a, a somewhat different uh, a microbiome component that might be relevant in terms of whether it be uh, for immune surveillance or, or um, for other reasons. Um, so um, I agree with you. and. Part of that also, in, aside from sort of the more nuanced aspects of molecular features, um, the, the, the more practical clinical observation, which I'm sure uh, Olatunji and others have noted, is, is, is we have many patients who have um, lung-only metastases, and, and we've sort of looked at our experience with that at, at UCSF, and certainly those patients have much more indolent disease biology. So if you do a deeper dive into some of these studies and see those patients who have uh, looking even looking at their anatomic sites of metastases, that might that might influence some of the results as well. And then uh, another question from Dr. Uh, L. Oster. Thank you for the nice talk. Uh, would you consider upfront IO uh, for MSI high patients who cannot tolerate chemotherapy or actually decline chemo? Uh, what is your experience in terms of outcomes? in this uh, treatment-naive MSI high pancreatic cancer patients, knowing that they actually do better with chemo? Yeah, it's a fair question. And I will say, even though I pointed out that I, I myself would start with chemotherapy for MSI high patients, I, I do have uh, some colleagues who absolutely, when they have a Lynch patient uh, with, um, with pancreas cancer, will start upfront with, with immunotherapy. Um, in, in my experience, I, I actually have had a pretty good experience with, um, uh, with MI high disease in terms of seeing prolonged disease control in, for example, in a locally advanced patient um, who uh, I'll, I'll note parenthetically also developed uh, immune-related diabetes as a result of that. Um, but um, in general, I, I do want to make sure that MSI high patients at some point do get to at least try an immune, immune checkpoint inhibitor. Um, I'm not yet at the point of being able to uh, bring it to the frontline setting um, uh, just from my, uh, just from the data as I presented from the, uh, from the keynote study. Um, and if you look at companion uh, guidelines listing, it's, it's not necessarily the preferred choice um, frontline. It obviously begs the question of whether, you know, you could even give chemo plus an immune, immune checkpoint inhibitor in such patients. We don't have the data to support that. Uh, more broadly, the, 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 that combination in the frontline setting in unselected patients does not look particularly impressive, but perhaps in the MSI high patients, um, you may get a little more traction. But I haven't, I've not used that combination strategy in MSI high patients. So I usually start with chemo, move on to immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy later. And if we can quickly take uh, one last question from Dr. David Lawson. Uh, he's asking if there's any experience with uh, attacking the stroma rather than the cancer cells. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, there have been a number of efforts. And, uh, you know, if I were to go very autobiographical in some of the unsuccessful trials I've uh, been in, involved in, um, we, we have had, an, because there's been a tremendous interest in, in targeting the stroma, uh, 
Uh, that includes with um, agents like um, hedgehog inhibitors, which basically blocks a particular paracrine signaling pathway um, that helps mediate um, uh, tumor stromal development. Um, there was a drug that actually went to a large phase three study, a pegylated form of hyaluronidase, which is an enzyme that breaks down the hyaluronic acid component of the tumor stroma. Um, and again, that looked terrific in mouse models, but in, in sort of a large phase three study, uh, unfortunately, it was negative when combined with chemotherapy. Um, and then currently, there is, there is a study um, in the locally advanced setting um, uh, with uh, an agent called pimrevlimab, which is an anti-connective tissue growth factor um, antibody. So uh, sort of trying to block signaling of the, of, as this name implies, connective tissue growth factor. Um, and that um, uh, study we're waiting a readout of. So th the answer is yes, there's, there's many different ways of trying to pharmacologically manipulate or, or modify um, the stroma, um, but uh, nothing yet that's been a home run, I'll say that, but that hasn't uh, prevented our ongoing efforts. Thank you. Thank you once again, Andrew. It's been a, a real pleasure uh, speaking with you and Hopefully, we'll get to bring you down to Atlanta one of these days. All right. Thank you all for, uh, for uh, joining and listening. I appreciate it. Nice Bye. to meet you virtually. Thank you.